Coming up next is Dr. Kimberly Taylor. Here's your chance to talk about what matters to you. Although you will receive helpful advice from Dr. Taylor, remember, this is not to be construed as a form of psychotherapy, diagnosis, or treatment, and cannot replace a therapeutic relationship with a mental health professional. You can reach Dr. Taylor by calling 564-1290 or toll free at 866-564-1290. You can also listen live on the internet at drkimtaylorshow.com. So here now is Dr. Kimberly Taylor. We are going to dip into the darker side of life today as we talk about an epidemic among us. It's heroin. No longer is it the drug of choice for only the hardcore drug users or the rock and roll crowd. Heroin today is in our neighborhoods, it's in our schools, and it's seducing our children. The greatest increase in heroin use is seen in young adults age 18 to 25. We've all heard the heart-wrenching stories of people in the news who have overdosed on this particular drug. And the fact is, is that the use of heroin over the past five years is in epidemic proportions in small and large towns across the U.S. We really need to wake up to these alarming facts as heroin use is on the rise and it's becoming more popular every day. Heroin is one of the most destructive and addictive drugs in the world. And many individuals start out using prescription opiate-based painkillers, such as oxycodone. Then as they build up a tolerance to the pain pills, they find that they can buy heroin far more cheaply than prescription medications. And those who become addicted to heroin can quickly lose control of their lives as they become powerless against the drug and the endless search for their next fix. Heroin can be injected or inhaled by snorting or sniffing, or smoked. But all three roots carry the drug to the brain very rapidly, and it delivers a feeling of euphoria. As it reaches the areas of the brain stem, it actually affects the automatic processes that are critical for life functioning. Fatal heroin overdoses are on the rise because of the increased use, but also because of the increase in the high purity of heroin at the street level. And then, because a growing number of people using the drug are starting it at a younger age. Here are the words of a heroin addict. The draw of heroin is that you can forget all of the stress in your life. If you use it regularly, you disregard everything that is important in your life. It doesn't matter if you were supposed to be at work, if you're spending all of your money or maxing out your credit cards. You convince yourself you're better off without your family and friends. And the further you slip, the more heroin you have to use in order to keep reality from crashing down on you. Just one more day you keep saying, and every day it's a bit harder to quit, and every day you're a bit further removed from reality. And that, in a nutshell, is heroin addiction. If you're trying to help someone, or if you have questions, or if you need help, you want to listen to the program today because I have with me Dr. Evan Miller. He is a leader in the field of addiction, and he holds a Ph.D. in clinical psychology and is a registered addiction specialist. So if you have questions, give us a call. You can reach us at 564-1290 or toll-free at 866-564-1290. So stay with me during the break, and I'll be right back with my guest. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. You are listening to Dr. Kimberly Taylor. You can reach her by calling 564-1290 or toll-free at 866-564-1290. I am here now with Dr. Evan Miller. He holds a Ph.D. in clinical psychology, and he is a, a registered addiction specialist. Welcome, Dr. Miller. Thanks for having me, Dr. Kim. Yes. Let's start, because I think this may be surprising to a lot of parents, is what is the current demographic of the breakdown of teens that are using this drug right now? Yeah, so this is something that might sound pretty surprising. Um, The typical heroin user isn't someone who is a street person, someone that you would imagine um, would be kind of in an alley or in dark places, in in poor places. What we're seeing in the field 
today is that a lot of heroin users are, uh, they come from good families, um, affluent families, tend to be well educated. Um, they might still be doing well in school. Um, they have friends. They might be popular in school, um, having played sports. You know, a lot of the stories that we hear and clients that we treat tend to be, you know, former athletes who have um, undergone an injury and from there have had to turn to prescription pain pills to address the injury um, and only to have quickly kind of fallen down the slippery slope to heroin use. So um, it's important that people listening know that heroin users um, look like your average, uh, you know, American. It's not necessarily something that's um, delegated to poorer populations. So uh, it's important that we all are very, very aware of that. Okay, so you bring up a good point, is that lots of times this starts out using one drug because they have been in pain or that they're trying to treat something that has happened to them. So how does that lead to this a particular drug? Yeah, so I'll give you a, a kind of a common scenario is... Um, you know, Johnny plays football for the football team. He gets injured during one practice and has to go see a doctor uh, because he hurt his knee. Um, the doctor might briefly prescribe a small round of, say, Vicodin or another opiate pain medication to help him address his knee, um, at which time he does take the medication and it helps alleviate the pain. What happens, though, oftentimes, and this is probably the most common um, common theme, is that you take one more pill than, than is needed, and you start to feel that kind of euphoric rush. Um, and then another pill to even make you feel better until um, the, the pain pill is, uh, the whole bottle is gone, and, and you found yourself in a situation where now um, getting off the pills is more difficult than you thought before because of uh, potential withdrawal symptoms. So what starts oftentimes as a sports injury or as, say, a wisdom tooth surgery quickly becomes um, something that slides very quickly downhill. Now, people start with prescription pain pills, um, and then they'll maybe seek them on the street. However, it's very expensive to maintain that habit. And why heroin becomes very attractive is because it's much cheaper and it's more economical, meaning that you can use less of it to get more of a high. And so this is, this is how it happens. It uh, happens very quick, and it happens to you know, a wide array of people, um, oftentimes brought on by some sort of, a, of an injury that we would go to see a doctor for. So is it true that once they try this, that they can become very quickly caught up in this and that it might only take one time in order to really become addicted to it? It can, yes, absolutely. That's, that's something that I've seen quite a bit in my practice here um, in our treatment center in Newport Beach, that... It just took kind of one one injury or um, one round of using these powerful drugs, um, and they became addicted. Um, it's something that happens very quickly. Mm -hmm. So you say that this is one way in which this is a gateway drug, is that they first start out getting a medication through a doctor, but then they quickly change from that. So is this the only gateway drug that really leads to this, or are there a lot of others out there also? Yeah, that's a really, really great question, Dr. Kim. So what we're seeing here is oftentimes before a uh, full-blown heroin uh, addiction, you'll see marijuana use. You'll see alcohol use um, because they're so readily available, especially now with the new marijuana laws. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll see the prescription pills being abused. So those tend to be those tend to come before um, IV heroin use, and they they are just as you know. I will say alcohol, especially, is, is a drug that's just as dangerous um, as heroin in terms of its effect on the body. And so, if we we're to kind of look at the typical heroin user, I think you will see alcohol use, you'll see marijuana use in their history, um, and almost always you'll see pain medication use. Um, I want to make a point really quickly as well, which is oftentimes I think um, because we live in a culture that is so, um, that, pro that, that really wants us to take medical advice, see doctors, take care of our health um, from every perspective, a holistic perspective and whatnot, this idea that if we go to a doctor and he gives us something, that it's okay. 
and it's because I got it from a doctor, it must be safe. These prescription opiate medications um, must be taken with a ton of caution and under um, a ton of care because just because you receive them from a doctor and use them as prescribed, um, the, the tendency to potentially start abusing them is very high. And so I really want to make sure that your viewers are aware of uh, just how dangerous these drugs can be. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that they don't have very great uses for, you know, severe pain. Uh, but we just want to be very careful um, before we, we engage them. Okay, so one of the things, because why I really want to put this out there, is to help parents so that parents know that these teens are knowing about this drug. They're seeing other kids on this drug. And that what would be really good is for parents to know that if they do need to take their child in, like you say, to get their teeth worked on or something else, and if they are going to have a drug to take care of that, that they want to be very careful about how they watch their child and what their reaction is to the drugs that they are are using so that they make sure that they're not craving more or needing more after the prescription runs out. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Most of the time, because you said that sometimes people who drink, we can obviously see that someone is drunk. But how do you tell if someone is uh, using this drug? Is it uh, visible or is it mostly invisible? Yeah, so uh, that's a really good point. You're not going to smell the prescription pain pill use like you would uh, smelling someone who's just drank alcohol, who's smoked marijuana. Um, the the signs of someone who's abusing opiate medications or heroin, uh, it looks a little bit different. You know, oftentimes you might see them nodding off, um, kind of eyes rolled back in their head during kind of strange times throughout the day. Um, you know, in, in situations that wouldn't necessarily be deemed normal, for example, in the middle of class or a middle of a dinner. Um, these, this, this is not normal, and it should be behavior that's, that's noted by the parent. Um, oftentimes, they will just kind of look pale and almost ghostly in terms of their skin color and have this kind of um, this, this greasy kind of sweatiness as well um, in the later stages of the use. Um, also, something to be aware of is if, your son or daughter is is wearing long sleeves and multiple layers when it's warm or or even hot outside. Now, these are all kind of things that you just want to be be kind of aware of because um, of potential, you know, especially for heroin, the the syringe site on the arm um, is oftentimes very visible. And so they will wear sweaters or long sleeves in order to cover that up. Okay, so those are some of the uh, physical signs. What about... As far as their be behavior, what should parents look for there? Right. And so someone who has a, a opiate addiction and, uh, you know, heroin abuse, what we're seeing and what you should be aware of is that, and what you should know, is that there comes a point when they stop needing the drug to get high and they start needing the drug to prevent themselves from getting sick. And what I mean by that is the withdrawal symptoms from heroin are so severe, it looks like the worst flu, you know, you've ever had. Uh, The chills, throwing up, nausea, diarrhea, all of these things um, are going to come into play once they stop using. So in order to prevent from getting sick, they'll oftentimes go to any length to, to do that. And that would be stealing money. That would be taking things from the home and, and selling them at pawn shops or on the street. Um, That would be taking credit cards, uh, taking blank checks, really anything to get money to support the habit. And so this is what the behavior would look like. Okay, and part of it would be that perhaps they would be falling off at school, that they might not be having the same friends as they used to have, that they might be more interested in a new set of friends, and they should be aware when that happens that friends who were once very important to them, that they then start to, you know, change that and move toward a a different crowd. Also, if they're perhaps late for work, if they have a job or they constantly want to be absent because they're sick with some of these uh, symptoms that you just said. Sure. Yeah, no, those are all good points. In terms of the peer group, I do want to add that, you know, it doesn't always look like um, all of a sudden they get a new set of friends. It could be that the entire group of friends um, all of a sudden just started taking pills or right. using. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not always the case that, 
wow, all of a sudden, you know, he's hanging out with this kind of rougher crowd. That doesn't necessarily have to be in place. And one thing parents need to know, too, is it's not that they're always going to be in a good mood while they're high. They're also going to become very moody, very depressed, very anxious sometimes, too, right? absolutely. Is it true that with this drug, they have real highs and then real lows, but it is always kind of an up and down? It's never even? Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, especially in the early early stages of use, um, the highs can, you know, obviously feel like euphoria because of the neurotransmitters that are released in the brain. Um, but inevitably, there will be a crash, um, and and this would look like the, you know, depression, sleeping a lot, um, irritability, anxiety, and so forth. As the use progresses, the highs become much less, and the lows become much much darker and deeper. And what else should parents look for as far as how is this used and what are the things that they might use in order to have this habit? Yeah, first and foremost, check your medicine cabinets, okay? This is where it will originate, Um, kind of looking through the medicine cabinet, finding, oh, you know, here's an old bottle of Vicodin that dad had uh, from, you know, the back surgery years ago. That's the place to start. Uh, Make sure that your prescription medications um, are in a safe place that, that are away um, from, from your son or daughter who you think might be uh, abusing these medications. Um, secondly, for, for more you know, extensive heroin use, you'll see things like you know, spoons, uh, tin foil, you know, syringes, um, things like that, which are all household items um, you know, aside from the syringe. Uh, they, they might go missing. Um, so th- just an awareness. And I, I don't want to create this kind of uh, paranoid fear. I feel like, you know, we're really, really focusing on um, kind of let's be alert. Let's all be alert here. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's just an awareness to have because it is, it is out there. Um, what I will say is having an open, honest conversation with your son or daughter where um, y- they feel like they can trust you, and this obviously comes from years of, of parenting, um, that for them to trust you in the first place, obviously, that would be an ideal situation so that if they do find themselves um, potentially abusing or hanging out with people that are using, they can come to you and, and you can feel like you won't completely lambast them, but that you'll, you'll, you'll talk them through it. Um, mm-hmm. Open communication. And I think that is a great point, but I do think that one of the things that probably happens is they can become hooked on this so quickly that it takes them down a path that they are probably very lost and at that point in time really feel very fearful about trying to get help. And there's a certain amount of shame that must come with this too as they don't want to uh, disappoint parents or they're worried about what that parent might think. Sure. Yeah, there's incredible shame. The yeah. Shame Shame is kind of the cornerstone emotion um, in all addiction. I uh, would like to get back to that. We need to take a quick break, and we will be right back with Dr. Evan Miller. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. You are listening to Dr. Kimberly Taylor. You can reach her by calling 564-1290 or toll-free at 866-564-1290. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Evan Miller, and he is a leader in the field of addiction, and we are here talking about the problem of drug use. And as we are trying to understand why people use drugs, Dr. Miller puts on a lot of workshops, and one of the topics that you have in that workshop is that you cover something that you teach about of, I would rather die than feel. What does that mean, and how is that important in understanding drug use and addiction? Yeah, so what, I, what do we mean with the topic, I would rather die than feel, is it, fairly simple. What we know, Dr. Kim, is that a lot of addiction is a flight from distress. And so what I mean by that is um, a lot of addicts, alcoholics, have an incredibly difficult time regulating their emotions. Um, and so the purpose of this workshop is to this portion of the group specifically, is to address that, that really misconceived idea, which is like, I would rather put up with anything. I would rather put a needle in my arm. I would rather black out from drinking, and I would rather put white powder up my nose to avoid the conflicts in, in my daily life, the, the painful feelings that I have to feel, um, and, and, and do that instead of just simply feeling and moving through them. And so the topic in this workshop really... What I try to do is to get these young men to 
relive painful experiences and, and talk about them in a group with other men and realize that, wow, I don't have to use or drink in order to get through this. I can just kind of feel it. You know, it hurts. I don't like it, but it's temporary. Um, you know, I often tell, tell, uh, tell my guys, you know, no one's ever died from an emotion overdose, guys. Uh-huh. These things will pass, okay? Yes, yes. Um, so that, that, that's the gist of it. So you have with you right now um, someone who has been through your program, and he has been sober now for 18 months, and his name is Jack. And I would love to have him come on and really tell us the story of what happened to him, because I think parents are going to be helped by this young man's story. Yeah, absolutely. And he's right here. Okay. Hey, Dr. Kim, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. First off, I would like to thank you for coming on to share what has gone on for you, because I think it's really going to help. So could you tell us a bit about your story and how it all started? Absolutely. And it's a privilege for me to share this experience with you and anybody who's tuned in. Um, So for me, I was exceptionally young when this began. I was about 12 years old. Um... I had friends, I was in middle school, sixth grade. I had friends who were in the eighth grade. Um, my mom had just recently had surgery. And like Dr. Evan Miller was talking about, I was rummaging through her medicine cabinet, and that's when I found prescription pills. And um, I ate a couple, and I had this, I, I remember it, it was, I had this psychic change. So I remember feeling very insecure, less than the, the people around me, um, including my family, friends. Um, very uncomfortable in my own skin is how I felt. And then I had these pills um, about 20 minutes later. That All of that left me. You know, I felt comfortable. I felt excited to be around the people I was around. I felt good about myself. Um, so all these things that I was struggling with, they were gone. You know, it was like I was sitting on a pink cloud. And um, that's kind of how my um, addiction with opiates began. Let me just ask you something about that. How did you know that by taking those pills that it might relieve you of those feelings? I always, I always heard about what prescription pills, specifically painkillers, do to someone. Um, at the time, like I said, I had friends that were older than me. They were in the eighth grade, and they were with me as we were rummaging through her medicine cabinet. And I, didn't, I personally didn't know exactly what we were looking for, but they did. You know, they could read those prescription bottles. Mm. And um, one of them saw the prescription painkillers and said, hey, this is pretty cool. Let's do these. And I just wanted to fit in. You know, I wanted to do what they were doing. So I ate a couple, and that's when I felt the effects. And how soon did you know that you were hooked? Um, it was probably three, three weeks into actively using prescription painkillers on a daily basis. Um, I didn't use them. The prescription ran out. And I had a fever. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get off the couch. I was sweating. Uh, my bones were achy. And I thought I was legitimately sick. I didn't realize that, that I was withdrawals. going through withdrawals mm-hmm. until, you know, I had a couple painkillers and I wasn't sick anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized that I was physically addicted to opiates. And so the jump to heroin? So the jump to heroin is something um, that I went through after about a year, maybe 14 months tops of using opiates, um, prescription painkillers, and they were getting very expensive. My tolerance was elevating um, a lot, and uh, it was just too expensive for me to continue to buy these prescription painkillers. Um, I was always kind of scared of heroin because it had such a stigma to it, you know, and I just, uh, you know, I, when I thought of heroin, I thought a, that, a, of a drug that was going to kill me the first time I used it, which is very possible, but it didn't. Um, eventually, you know, I got to the point where I was desperate enough, um, and I knew that heroin was going to alleviate me of my sickness, so I tried it. And um, for about a third of the price that I spent on prescription painkillers, it worked, and it worked way better than prescription painkillers, and I felt great. And that's when I, was, I said enough, and I put the painkillers away, and I just did heroin on a daily basis. Okay, but I'm thinking this is all a 12-year-old doing all of this? No, by this point, I am 15. Okay, so yeah. it was you kind of moved into this, and were friends using with you, or was this more at a time that you just started to go out on your own with all of this? Um, no, my friends were using with me um, with the prescription painkillers, mm-hmm. um, and even when I started doing heroin, um, heroin was a pretty common drug for for my social network, and uh, it wasn't until about six months into using heroin that I started to isolate. 
So what are the signs that you think or what do you think that parents should know about this? What is it that you'd like to, you know, tell them at this point with what you went through? Um, I think it's very important for parents to know that prescription pills are a gateway drug for heroin. Um, it was for me, it was for the majority of my friends, um, and they're very easily to they're very easily attainable just by going into, you know, your parents' medicine cabinet. Mm-hmm. I um, my best drug dealer I ever had was my neighbor, and I lived in a very nice high income neighborhood in Connecticut. Um, all I had to do was walk down the street, you know, and I would pick up anything I wanted from prescription painkillers to heroin. Um, it, it's becoming so common with kids between the ages of 25 and 18. Um, it's just, it's not how I thought of it prior to getting involved with opiates was, okay, I had to go to, you know, a really scary part Dark of town. Alley, and right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it, mm-hmm. it, the reality is, it, yeah, you can get it there, too. But all I had to do was walk down the street to get it. Okay, so the first thing maybe is to let parents know that they should lock these uh, medications up. They shouldn't just be left in the bathroom. They should be locked up because they are drugs and they are uh, serious if they are in the wrong hands. Absolutely. What else should parents look for as far as if they think that their child may be using? Are there telltale signs or things that you think that parents should be more aware of? Yes, absolutely. Um, in regards to opiates, um, I would look for depression, isolation. Um, physical signs of using would be um, weight loss, um, you know, pinned pupils. Um, generally, like when someone is on opiates, whether it's heroin or painkillers, um, it's pretty apparent. Their stare, it's like they're gazing through you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a pretty obvious sight if, if they're using Um, loss of friends, lack of self-esteem, not taking interest in something they had interest in prior, like whether it's hobbies, exercising, maybe they play sports and they don't want to play sports anymore, things like that. What do you think that your parents could have done that might have helped you? That's a tough question for me to answer because my parents always did their best. Right. With me growing up, um, I think if anything, maybe they could have locked up the medications that were so readily available to me. Um, however, it's not really their fault that I went out and you know and looked for them um, in their medicine cabinets. But uh, I mean, they did everything that they could for me. They they put me through treatment multiple times. You know, they did everything they could. They they supported me um, when I was at my lowest. Um, I guess the one thing that they could have done Mm -hmm. was not enable me for so long. You know, when my addiction to heroin was out of control, um, they just didn't have the heart to kick me out and cut me off financially. So I used that and continued to, to use opiates because I had the financial resources to do so. And so parents really need to hear that they have to have tough love here, that they really have to make it impossible for you to do anything but treatment. That's absolutely right. And um, okay. the number one thing I see, because I, I myself now kind of work in the recovery realm and I get to help other young men who are struggling with this addiction, I see that parents are crippling them um, with money, with support. They won't kick them out of the house. They won't show them that they're, uh, this isn't, this isn't going to happen in my house. You know, they'll let them live there and actively use heroin or painkillers. Um, they'll give them money to go out and get it. So it's really important to uh, to exert tough love in these situations. I think that's a really good word to hear from you, to hear from the kid, that the kid says parents should be tougher, they should set boundaries. How old are you now? I'm 20. And you've been sober for how long? I've been sober for 18 months. Okay. And how is your treatment going? Incredible. Because you sound incredible. Thank you. Yeah, and I really, really want to thank you for coming on because I think that you have a lot to share. I'm glad you are involved in helping others because hearing it from someone who has been through it is probably the best advice that someone can get if they are going through this because I think for the most part, they don't feel like anybody gets it. Right, and that's how I felt too, and that's that's just that's going to happen in the addiction, you know, isolating, feeling like no one is there for you or no one understands, but that's just false. You know, there's tons of people who are just like me who are getting, who are getting sober, you know, Mm -hmm. um, 
progressing in their recovery who want nothing more than to, you know, lend a hand and, and show someone who's struggling how to do this, you know. Um, reaching out to other people that are struggling is kind of the cornerstone of my recovery right now. Um, it, it's a gift. It's a privilege for me, you mm-hmm. know, because I know how it feels to be alone, cooped up in your bedroom, you know, held captive in, in the chains of addiction with heroin. Right. And what I heard from you is that the treatment didn't work the first time. But what parents and friends and people who love you need to know is that you just need to keep trying until it does work because it will work. Right. And it didn't work for me because I didn't let it work. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't willing enough to make certain changes in my life that needed to be changed. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I am very glad that you have. And we actually need to take a break, and we will come back with Dr. Evan uh, Miller. And, Jack, I want to thank you once more very much for coming on air and telling your story. Absolutely, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. You are listening to Dr. Kimberly Taylor. You can reach her by calling 564-1290 or toll-free at 866-564-1290. I am here with Dr. Evan Miller, and we just spoke to Jack, who shared his story, which I have to say was a very uh, touching story. It touched all of us here. Just about his uh, journey through drug use to this other side where he is now there, and he can help a lot of other people that need to go through this journey too. So, Dr. Miller, is it true that until you really admit that you have this problem, that it's not possible to decrease its power that it has over you? Yeah, so... The, the, the belief in, in the addiction community, and especially as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, is the first step to getting better is admitting a level of powerlessness. And so what this does is it really um, deeply causes a level of humility where one can begin to let go of things like control and often the manipulation that accompanies uh, control and begin to to humble themselves to, to do the work to begin to heal. Um, in addiction, you know, it's my belief that this experience is required um, in order for somebody to, to really take the first steps towards healing. Um, and oftentimes it's, it's the most difficult step because you're admitting, you know, oftentimes people who are addicts and alcoholics are incredibly successful. You know, outwardly, They do very well in the real world, Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes holding large positions, um, but there's just this one facet of their life that they just can't quite control, and that's their drinking and using. So admitting that can be very difficult um, for those of us who are in recovery, and I say us because I myself am in recovery and really fit that mold. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So there are some people who think that this is a, a disease, and there's others out there who think it has more to do with character and willpower. What is your view, and how does that really affect the treatment? Yeah, my view is, look, addiction, um, drug abuse, whatever you want to call this thing, is a beast. And so we need to bring as much understanding, as many perspectives to the table as possible. So I'm not going to throw out one perspective for another. You know, I think that we need to look at it as a disease. We also need to see that there are these underlying dynamics that help fuel what's going on, you know, um, For the disease model, for example, there must be an organ at play, all right? So we have the brain for addiction. There has to be some sort of a dysfunction occurring in the organ, and then there have to be symptoms. And so for addiction, what this looks like, the symptoms that, you know, I've touched upon that Jack so eloquently spoke about, uh, things like stealing, like uh, manipulating, like cheating, like lying, you know, ending up in jail, ending up in hospitals from your use. These are all very measurable, observable symptoms. So the idea that addiction is a disease is, is one that fits and fits well, and it's something that the AMA has, has withheld for, for quite a few years now. Um, that's not to say that we should discount the other perspective as well, which is let's look at one's childhood, let's look at one's history, let's look at one's potential traumatic events that have occurred and how those play into this kind of behavior as well. Uh, you know, so bottom line is we need to be very open-minded and bring as much insight and intelligence to the table that we can. Are there factors that underlie addiction? I mean, is there a reason? Is it something that people are searching for? Is there an understanding about what it is that starts this off? 
you know, so some of the more psychological components that we see in, in addicts across the board are a few things. One, low self-esteem. You know, and Jack touched upon this uh, when he spoke, saying, and mm-hmm. you know, I just felt like I didn't fit in. I didn't wasn't comfortable in my own skin. You know, that is something that everyone who walks through the doors here at the landing, uh, our, our treatment program here in Newport, they they struggle with very low self esteem. The other is poor impulse control. There's there's this inability to know when to stop, um, even though in your right brain you think I probably shouldn't do this. You find yourself doing it over and over and over. And then the third thing would be an incredible difficulty in self-soothing. You know, mm-hmm. People who are struggling with substance abuse are incredibly inept at regulating just how they're feeling. Um, that's is why we reach for something outside of ourselves to take care of this gaping hole inside of ourselves. Okay, but we have to come to uh, realize that it is an inside job. You have to be able to find the ways to do that for yourself without trying to seek it on an outside source. Yes. So what are the best treatment programs that help people really to recover from this? Yeah, so a treatment program must have uh, a structure in place that creates an environment away from drugs and alcohol first and foremost. It has to provide a, a place where someone physically can heal and clear from the effects. Um, then what I always want to see is uh, a complete addressing of family dynamics. You know, we know that addiction is a family disease in that Mm -hmm. everybody from mom to dad to sister who's ever involved in the addict's life, they've played a role in in the addiction in some way or another. They've either enabled it, they've either been, you know, the bad cop, they've either kind of been the hero of the family to kind of take the spotlight off of the addict. There's there's kind of a whole array of, of behavior that goes into the family system that must be addressed. Um, I also want to see healthy nutrition. We, we hear uh, in my program, we, we can really shape a lot of behavior based on what we feed our clients. And so we're giving them real fresh food that allows the brain to begin to truly heal. And then the final piece, um, amongst many others, but for purposes of time, is a, a relationship to some sort of power beyond oneself. And I don't care if you call that thing God or if you call it the spirit of the universe, or if you call it, um, you know, this computer in front of you. There has to be a belief that um, something is greater than me and has, has more significance than my own willpower. Um, the spiritual process is something that um, is so incredibly important for recovery, um, and it's oftentimes the most difficult piece for our clients to truly um, put in practice because it does require, like I said, a level of humility that, you know, I'm going to have to let go sometimes. Uh, I'm going to pray sometimes. I'm going to really turn my life over to something greater than myself. And all of these things that you're talking about, it is really being able to be more in touch with oneself and to be able to self-soothe, to understand oneself better, and to be able to work through some of the feelings that they have rather than to run from them and f- and feel like they have to then go and numb themselves from what they're just feeling in their life. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly right. So you do have a program. It's called The Landing. Correct. And how can uh, people reach you? Yeah, so if you go to um, our website, which is probably the easiest way to do it, uh, go to soberlanding.com, and you'll be able to See what we offer. Um, there's a phone number there that if you or a loved one or a, f- a friend is in need, please call uh, my team of people. You know, whether it's you want treatment here or you just want advice and you, or you want someone to talk to you because you feel like you're alone in this thing, uh, we're here. You know, we know that this, this, this experience of having struggling with substance abuse or having somebody you love struggle uh, can feel so isolating. And so... If you do uh, find yourself feeling like this, please give us a call, and we'd be happy to help you in any way we can, whether that's you know, getting you down here to our program or finding you a program that fits uh, what exactly you're looking for. And I am going to post those on my website, too. And then just, just lastly, that we did touch on this, but I'd like to say it once more, that if someone has a relapse that they're trying to get sober, but they have a relapse, that, in fact, does not mean that treatment has failed, Correct. Correct. Yeah. So it is more a course of what? That they keep doing it until it works and they keep getting back into 
a program or a treatment? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's just going to take um, it's going to take the the proper time. You know, oftentimes uh, we say, you know, you haven't quite hit the bottom you needed to hit. Sometimes that needs to to happen. Thank you very much for all of your advice, and I once more want to thank Jack, too, for uh, coming on and sharing his uh, story. I think we learn a lot by people like him and you that will come on and say that they had a problem but found a way to move through it. So well, thank you, Dr. I'd like to thank you a, both. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. We will be right back after the break. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. I am very happy to have had our two guests, Dr. Evan Miller and also Jack, who has helped us to understand what is going on with heroin use and how parents and or friends and or those who are involved in this can actually get help, that there is help. Uh, One of the ways to reach Dr. Evan Miller is to go to SoberLanding.com. And also, I will post this on my website. What I would like to say as we close is that there are a few ways to tell if someone you know is uh, using drugs. One is that there are sudden changes in their outlook, their behavior, and that those who were once cheerful and full of life can turn into very sullen and very angry people when they are under the influence of drugs. A second one might be that there's a change in friends. Well, they may tend to start to hang around other people that they were not friends with, and they will have left their oldest or most trusted friendships behind. Something else you need to look for is any kind of drug objects like um, needles, syringes, scales, spoons, candles, lighters, cotton balls, rubber tubing. These are some of the things that you really need to look for if you think that something may be going on with your child. Also, there's the issue of uh, money, that this kind of a drug habit costs money. So they may be asking friends or family for money, or when that fails, they may be stealing money out of purses and uh, wallets. Also, if you find that there are some things in the home that are starting to go uh, missing, that it may very well be that they are using those to sell. That is a common means of trying to support a drug habit. Also, if you see any kind of track marks or other kinds of cuts or things like that on their uh, body, because over time, these tracks become harder and harder to hide. And then lastly, if there's some kind of drop in work or school performance that those who start to become addicted really are not able to focus on anything besides getting that drug and finding their next fix. So you will often see that a student who started to have A's or B's, that their grades will, will start to fall or they'll become truant and they won't show up at work and or at school. So it is very often up to the family members to rescue the person who is having the problem with drugs and to get him or her into treatment. And it may be only by knowing some of these signs that you can detect what is going on and start to make arrangements for some kind of treatment. These are very important issues, and you can be sure that we will do more of this in shows to come. But I would like to thank you for uh, joining me and I welcome any of your comments. You can email me at Dr. Kim at drkimtaylorshow.com. You can also go to my website to find out how to download the podcast or to listen to a previous show. Just go to drkimtaylorshow.com. It's all there. If you couldn't call in today, but if you have a question and would like to, you can call me this Sunday. You can go to my website again and find out the phone number and the times to do that. So as we close... I just want to leave you with this thought. Don't forget that nobody else has to change in order for you to get better. And it's true. If you want something to be different, you can change it. Stop waiting for someone else to do it. Be the change that you want to create. And I'll see you next week.